Hello and welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm John Bachman. Joining us right now from our studio in New York City is Rich Lowry. He is the editor of the National Review and he's here for a special Newsmax exclusive interview today to talk about the 150th anniversary of the, bat of the battle at Gettysburg. Also, uh, Rich just wrote a new book called Lincoln Unbound. Rich, it's great to have you with us. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. So here we are, 150 years after a pivotal battle during the Civil War, but uh, I want to actually uh, start this uh, commemoration of this battle at the Gettysburg Address. And of course, most Americans uh, are forced to learn this speech at some point in their schooling. And when you read the speech, uh, Lincoln kind of uh, alludes to the fact that he seems to know that this speech is going to be important someday, and he doesn't want the crowd in attendance to focus more on the speech than on the fact uh, that so many people lost their lives uh, on that battlefield on that particular day. Um, but do you think, or, or I guess I should ask you, at what point do you think that, re that Lincoln realized uh, that this battle changed uh, the course of his presidency, changed uh, the course of the Civil War, and really uh, changed the course uh, of the nation as a whole? Well, it's obviously a key battle because Lee goes to the North hoping that uh, he can break Northern will and force peace negotiations. I mean, the South obviously wasn't going to conquer the North, but there was a chance it could, give, uh, it could force the North to give up, and any hope of that was really lost at Gettysburg. And Lincoln realized um, throughout his political career, not just when he was president, the the centrality of public opinion, and he realized his ability as president to influence public opinion. So he relished opportunities uh, that he had like this to carry an argument forward uh, to the public. And people focused on how short the speech was, just 272 words. Apparently, um, accounts differ, John, but apparently the audience was a little bit stunned by the shortness of it, or at least didn't have any chance to get into it because it ended so quickly. But a key thing about how brief it was is that you would ensure that newspapers would reprint it in full and they'd probably reprint it on the front page of their papers. So Lincoln, through his uh, verbalized expression that day, actually giving the speech, could reach thousands of people, but through the papers, he could reach millions. And he wanted to make a very strong statement about the, the meaning and the ultimate consequence of the war and the meaning of this nation, and obviously succeeded brilliantly in a speech that is, has echoed down through the ages and will continue to do so th through all time, I believe. And I know you talked about this while you've been talking about the book a lot, but Lincoln really did understand how to tap in uh, to public opinion and really read it very well, which is kind of uncanny considering, uh, you know, how there was no internet back then. There weren't really uh, telephones. People could communicate uh, with uh, telegraphs and things like that. But, you know, he really seemed to get what the American people were thinking. Um, yeah, well, it was a very word-oriented culture, which is, is different than today when we really have an image uh, oriented culture. And that's why people tend to contrast you know, Lincoln's short, brilliant speech with the supposed windbaggery of Edward Everett, who spoke before him, who went on for two hours, two and a half hours. But people enjoyed that speech. They expected long, um, s flowery orations and enjoyed it. It was entertainment uh, and uh, information. So Everett didn't fall flat. It's just that we're, we will always remember uh, Lincoln's words. And they're so brilliant because, as many people have commented, they're really a kind of prose poem. And Lincoln loved the musicality of words. He was soaked in the Bible, soaked in Shakespeare. He loved poetry. He was a little bit of an amateur poet himself. He wrote a little ditty in the White House after the battle, kind of mocking uh, General Lee. So this is a speech, there's a myth that he just kind of wrote it on the train and you know jotted it on the back of the envelope and that was it. That's not how he prepared any of his speeches. He cared so much about words, especially you know what was going to be such an important speech at such an important occasion. So he revised it repeatedly before before he delivered it and revised it even after it was delivered for the newspapers. Yeah, he certainly understood the efficiency uh, that comes along with picking the right word for the right situation. Uh, you know, at one point during the battle, uh, I think it was after the first day of fighting, the Confederate flag was flying uh, over the North in Gettysburg uh, in 1863. Was it ever known at the White House? Did Lincoln uh, during the battle get uh, specific updates and know that Union troops were really in deep trouble uh, after the battle had first started? Well, he famously monitored uh, military operations very closely, spending a lot of time in the, the telegraph 
office and it would have you know it hadn't been uh, good times generally <laughs> for the Union Army and on July 2nd the second day of the battle Lee really thought he had won and nearly had won on, on that day uh, the Confederate troops nearly broke the Union lines and that's why on July 3rd the final day of the battle Lee thinks it just t takes one final push and this is the famous or infamous Pickett's Charge 10,000 or so troops going straight at the Union line. They have to go through about a mile, uh, run about a mile through fearsome Union artillery, and it turned out just to be a, a meat grinder, kind of the opposite of what happened at Fredericksburg when the Union had, um, in a very ill-advised Ill uh, maneuver, had forced their troops to run uh, in, in an open field through such harrowing fire. And it really, it, it broke the Confederate Army. Lee was defeated. He had to retreat. He offers his resignation to Jefferson Davis. It's not accepted because now the only way it seems as though that the South can survive is by relying on the, the magical generalship of Robert E. Lee, but he'll never again regain the military initiative after that. And so it's still some what of a debate, you know, for civil war, civil war buffs and historians as they look back. Lee understood the urgency uh, of this time period, but as we talked about, this battle started kind of an accident when these uh, when Lee's men ran into Union troops uh, in Gettysburg. Uh, but was Lee's move to get out of the South and try to take the the battle to the Union Army on the North, uh, you know? A, a, him maybe being a little bit too aggressive, or was it more a sign of uh, his desperation knowing that um, things weren't always going to be getting better for the Confederacy and the Union had and had such an advantage for a, for a longer war because of so much of the manufacturing, everything was in the North? Yeah, um, maybe a little of all of that. And, and so much of the war had been fought in Virginia. So Virginia was really chewed up and devastated. And this was an opportunity for the Confederate Army uh, to get out of Virginia and go to Pennsylvania. And Lee had a couple of different ideas. One, if the, the uh, Union just decided to take up a defensive position and defend Washington and let Lee roam free in Pennsylvania, well then his troops could spend a couple months living off the land, uh, this rich farmland in Pennsylvania. Uh, on the other hand, if Union uh, troops pursued and sought a battle, Lee was hoping that the Union troops, uh, the Union forces would be kind of strung out in a way where he would be able to turn on them, pounce on them, and beat them piece by piece. As you say, as it turns out, it was a little bit of an accidental uh, engagement that began. And on that first day, maybe the prudent thing for Lee would have been to kind of pull back and uh, get a fuller picture of the battlefield and a better understanding of how many federal troops were there. But he thought his guys were winning, so there's no way he's going to pull back. And he, uh, um, he, he uh, pr pr uh, continued to pursue um, the offensive. And again, came very close to winning. Um, but then it ended in disaster for him. Yeah, and uh, let's focus back on Lincoln a little bit. After Gettysburg, he made that plea to governors and the nation, really, uh, for 300,000 new volunteers for the Union Army. And he was sure to remind everyone that states which did not enlist a certain number of new troops, well, those folks were likely going to be drafted anyway. Was this Lincoln trying to uh, raise Union morale, being so out in front of all this? Or was this a sign that Lincoln really understood that even though Gettysburg had really changed the direction of the war, that there would still be an enormous price to pay uh, in terms of casualties? Well, w one thing that, uh, you know, is a Union victory, but for Lincoln, a very bittersweet uh, victory because General Meade did not pursue uh, Lee's army in the retreat. And there's a great historical debate about this, about, um, and, and was the Union Army in shape enough to actually pursue uh, Lee's army? President Lincoln thought that it was, and President Lincoln throughout the war had been just frustrated because he knew it was absolutely central strategically to destroy the Confederate Army. That was the center of gravity in the war, and here he saw it again slipping, he believed, from the, the Union Army's fingers, and he was just uh, despairing uh, over that. So it meant the conflict would continue, it meant that the meat grinder for both sides would continue, and it meant that the, the draft, which was extremely unpopular, obviously in the North, especially where I'm talking to you from here in New York City, yeah. where you famously right. had riots. So it, again, it shows we tend to think big historical events are inevitable. They would have turned out, you know, the way they turned out, that's just inexorably the way they had to go. It's never the case. And if a few things had bounced a different way in Gettysburg, we might have an entirely different civil war.
And, and that is, you know, something that historians like to talk about, you know, all the hypothetical situations from the, the smallest detail that, you know, the uh, Confederates not taking some of the high ground and not getting in those defensive positions, what could have happened? You know, and it, today, when folks uh, go see these uh, battlefields, I, I think they spend a lot of money restoring uh, a diorama there in Gettysburg. And there's one of these in Atlanta, which is where I grew up. I grew up a lot around a lot of these Civil War battlefields. But when people go uh, visit Civil War battlefields like Gettysburg today, do you think they have uh, an appreciation for how closely this nation came to collapsing right before Independence Day of 1863? Um, I don't know whether they, they do, and, and they also may not have an appreciation of just ap how absolutely harrowing uh, these battles were. And altogether, between the Confederates and the, the Union troops, there are about 50,000 casualties over the course of those three days, killed, wounded, missing. And uh, my understanding is that of the 3,900 uh, dead who were buried there at Gettysburg, a quarter of them were unknown. So you couldn't figure out who they were, which gives you an idea of ju just how um, ast astonishingly bloody this was. And although we hallow uh, those, the, although we um, honor those words of Lincoln, and there's such hallowed words of the Gettysburg Address, it's always important to remember it was the dedication of a cer uh, cemetery, and just so many lives were lost on those days and throughout the years of what was um, a horrible national tragedy. And it really does uh, put things in perspective. Of course, the nation seems uh, divided uh, in 2013, but we have come certainly a long way uh, from 1863 and the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, of course, you can learn uh, more about uh, Abraham Lincoln and Rich's new book, uh, Lincoln Unbound. Rich Lowry, the editor of the National Review, a fascinating talk. I enjoyed uh, getting your thoughts on the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg. A pleasure talking. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. And thanks for watching Newsmax TV.